Thank you, Josh. Thank you, praise team, for leading us well this morning. That reminder that God is good and he's worthy of our praise. Um, it is good to be back with y'all uh, this week. Thank you uh, for allowing Ann Carter and I to have a little bit of a getaway last week. Uh, it was uh, refreshing for us, uh, but we're excited to be back with you today. We appreciate Philip Price for, uh, for preaching last week. Um, and thankful for his ministry uh, here in the county association and all of the, I don't, I don't know that uh, people realize just how much Philip does, but uh, I believe he's one of the hardest working men in ministry and we're thankful uh, for, his, for his ministry. And so uh, this week we're going to pick back up with the Beatitudes uh, and uh, we are in Matthew chapter 5 verse 6. And so we're halfway through the Beatitudes and uh, you, you may notice uh, if you uh, have read the entirety of the Beatitudes, that uh, there's a pattern that Jesus is, uh, is laying out for us here. Uh, John Piper, whenever he's talking about the Beatitudes, he, he calls it, uh, he, he likens it to a sandwich, which I really track well with because I think well in terms of food analogies. Uh, but if you notice, uh, Jesus begins and ends uh, the Beatitudes with this phrase, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, and so we're halfway through, this is the, the middle beatitude, and Jesus uh, addresses righteousness. He says, blessed are they who uh, hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, for they shall be satisfied, for they will be filled. Um, and then if you look at the last beatitude, he addresses righteousness again. And so there's a pattern here that Jesus is building upon. And so uh, halfway through the beatitudes, Jesus again poses what seems to be a pretty counterintuitive thought here. Um, I, I don't know about anybody else in the, the building, but I typically don't enjoy hunger and thirsting. Um, I, I have tried dieting where I didn't eat uh, that much. It was the worst 30 minutes of my life. Um, and so, so typically we would look at this idea of hungering and thirsting as something that is not appealing. But again, remember what Jesus is doing. He's pushing back on this kingdom that would seem to us to be uh, rightly ordered. And he's telling us, hey, there is a reality, there's a greater reality. I'm ushering in a kingdom that compared to this world is upside down. But it's for good reason, because that is where we find satisfaction. That is where we find contentment. The ethics of uh, kingdom citizens is where we find satisfaction. And so Jesus here poses this thought where dissatisfaction ultimately leads to satisfaction. Jesus is alluding here to the satisfaction that can only be found in the kingdom, and, and we kind of feel that tension. We kind of feel the tension of we're looking for things to bring us contentment, we're looking for things to satisfy and to occupy our time, but as we lean into things here on earth, we realize that there's a shelf life with contentment, being content with things of this world. Like it's good to get new things. I love, I love Christmas uh, for so many reasons, but one of the things that I, I enjoy about Christmas is I love, I love getting gifts. But it's, it's interesting how quickly those gifts, the, the, the appeal of those gifts wear off. Like I remember as, as a child in elementary school, I'd get a new toy and I'd take it to school in the first couple of weeks, uh, Everybody was so fascinated by everybody else's toys. And, and then a month later, like, nobody cared. And so that's what the world offers. That offers temporary contentment, temporary satisfaction. And, I mean, you, you need to only look so far as every year Apple releases new products. They release a new iPhone that looks oddly like the iPhone from the year ago. But there are people that I know that they clamor to get that new iPhone every year. And eventually, the iPhone that we do have, even if we don't get one every year, it wears out and we need a new one. We need new clothes. We need a new car. I don't know anybody that's still driving a mid-70s Chevy Vega. I, they're just not. At some point, you need a new car. You want a new car. And so the, the principle here is that there's shelf life on our contentment. And Jesus is leaning into this and he's saying, hey, to, in order to find contentment, let's first be discontent. Blessed are you. Congratulations are, are in order if you hunger and you thirst 
for righteousness. C.S. Lewis would say this of satisfaction in this world. He says, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. We weren't made for this world. And Jesus is, is leaning into that in, in the Beatitudes. And in fact, th- this most foundational desire in our life, it was actually placed there by God. There's, there's a reason why we will never find contentment in the things of this world. Arguably one of the richest men ever to live, John D. Rockefeller. He, uh, he was asked one time, how much money is enough? When will you be at a point where you're satisfied with your bank account? You know what his response was? One dollar more. If the richest man was not satisfied with his bank account, then where then do we look for satisfaction? Where then do we look for contentment? I think we need to contend with the fact that Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11, the writer says that God has put eternity into man's heart yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. If eternity is placed in our heart by God, whether we admit it or not, we know that there's something missing. We know that there's something else. So what that means is we're ultimately hungry for something that this world can't provide. And so Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. You know, there are a few analogies in Scripture that I really grasp well. And, and honestly, hungering and thirsting is one of them. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, like, I like to eat. I believe that my body is the temple of God, and I'm just on an expanding project. Um, so I, I love to eat. I don't like to be hungry, but I get it. I get the analogy of, of hunger. And Scripture uses that analogy over and over again to give us insight into the picture of our sanctification. So we see Paul leans into this pretty, pretty specifically. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, he's writing to the church at Philippi. We, we just walk through this epistle to the church, and, and he says this in verse 18 and 19. He says, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Remember, he's talking about Christians. He's talking about that community of believers. He says their end is destruction because their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So the idea here is that what we consume matters because what we hunger for should be God-focused. And we see time and time again that the, the, the adage of you are what you eat is, is actually true. Spiritually, it's true. Look at, look at Psalms 115. The, the psalmist starts that psalm by saying, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. And, and pretty quickly into that psalm, he switches from, a, from a language of worship to calling out idols. He says, you make idols with Eyes, but they can't see. With ears, but can't hear. Mouths, but can't talk. And then he says this. He says, those who worship them become like them. So spiritually, what we hunger for matters. We are what we eat, so to speak. And so our our hunger should be God-focused. And what that means for us is that, that we don't necessarily have to have everything together in our life because what God honors, as we're, as we're about to unpack, is a hunger for righteousness, a hunger for Him. We look back through, through Scripture and we see, we see samples, uh, examples of that. that. That imperfect people hungered after God and God blessed them. God, God uh, honored that. We look at Moses. Moses was a murderer with a temper, right? Bad combination. Moses often was impetuous. He did things out of anger. The reason that he couldn't go into the promised land was because he did something kind of dumb. He disobeyed God's direct command, and God said, you know, you can lead the people, but you're not going to go into the promised land. That, that's, this is the Moses that we're talking about. 
But in Exodus chapter 33, we, we see this conversation between God and Moses where God says, you know what, I'm just going to give you the promised land. I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to send an angel to, to, to wipe the slate clean, and, and the angel's going to deliver you. The angel's going to give you the promised land so that what I've promised you, you can have, but I'm not going to be there. God actually says, because the people are stiff-necked. I don't really know what that means, but if God says, it has to be pretty, pretty bad. And so Moses says this in Exodus thirty-three fifteen. He says, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Moses, in his imperfection, didn't hunger after God's gifts. He hungered after God. So Moses' hunger was God-focused. Our hunger should be God-focused. We see another example of this, David. David was an adulterous murderer, yet he was called a man after God's own heart. How do these things go together? One of these things is not like the other. A man after God's own heart and an adulterous murder, that, that doesn't make sense. But consider what David said in Psalms 42, 1 and 2. He said, as the deer longs for flowing streams, so longs my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So our appetite should be God-focused. What are you hungry for? What are we hungry for? Is it like the Philippians where our, our God is our belly? Our God is our own desires, our own needs, our own wants, money, prestige, material things? Or is our God the God of heaven? And is he the one that we hunger for? So our, our appetite should be God-focused. Our appetite should also be maturing. You know, there, there are often times that I, I look back on my life with, with deep regret because I'll be sitting at a restaurant eating something really good and think, why for the first 10 years of my life did I only want to eat McDonald's? That doesn't make sense. Why did I only want chicken tenders and fries whenever I could have crawfish, whenever I could have steak, Whenever I could have shrimp and grits. Our appetite should be maturing. I, there, there are a number of people and seasons in my life that I look back on. And, and they've had profound uh, effects on me in, in my dietary habits. Especially with coffee. There are two people in particular that have made a tremendous impact on my life. In terms of my coffee consumption. The first is my grandfather. Alfred. We called him Pop. Pop was, he was a coal miner in Tennessee. He was a bivocational pastor. An incredibly, incredibly kind man. And I would often go during the summer and spend the day at, at Pop's house. His wife, Annabelle, we called her Mama Ann. I'd spend, I'd spend the day at Pop and Mama Ann's house. And, and whenever I was six years old, I started experimenting with coffee. Every, every Tate man drinks coffee. In fact, my, like my, my childhood, the smell that I remember most is coffee. And whenever my uncles were there, it's coffee and cigarettes. But I, I remember, I remember everybody drank coffee. And so I thought, I want to get in on this. I want to, I want to drink coffee. And so I, I did what most every kid does that experiments with coffee. They hate straight coffee, right? So what I would do is I would put like a little bit of coffee, a little bit of milk, and a whole lot of sugar. To the point that, you, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. Like, whenever you get to the end of the, of the cup of coffee, like, there's that sludge in the bottom of it that you just, like, turn up and you just wait for it to, like, drip down the, the cup. And then you eat it, and then you're probably diabetic after that. Um, but that, that's how I drank my coffee. And, and one day, Pop was, was watching me, and I didn't, I didn't realize this. And I make my concoction that can loosely be called coffee, and I sat down at his kitchen table and was getting ready to enjoy my morning cup of coffee. And Pop walks in, and he picks up the cup of coffee. Doesn't say a word. Picks up the cup of coffee, takes it over to the sink, pours it in the sink, rinses it out, pours black coffee in it, sets it down on the table, and he says, Boy, if you're going to drink coffee, you're going to drink it right. 
And I said, you know, Pop, I don't think I, I, don't think I want coffee. He said, nope, you're going to drink it. And so at six years old, I started drinking my coffee black. And I, I loved, I loved Folgers. I loved the, the Nestle, like, really bad coffee. And so Pop was the first one. The second one, Brandon, thank you for making my life better whenever it comes to coffee. Like, I never knew how good coffee could be until I met Brandon a year and a half ago. But the, but the truth is that our tastes don't stay the same. As we grow and mature, our tastes grow and mature. We would think it was weird if a 40-year-old man was walking around eating crushed peas out of a Gerber baby food jar. If they walked around with a sippy cup and a pouch. Can I tell you, like, I've been curious about Sylvie James's food. And moment of confession here, babe. Like, I, I've tried, like, some of her pouches. And can I tell you, they're not that good. Like, give me fried chicken, give me a steak, give me spaghetti, give me all that. We would think it was weird if somebody was content eating baby food their entire life. We would question, we would question their taste and probably question their sanity. But here's the question. Why is it okay for us spiritually? Why is it okay for us to live on the spiritual crushed peas out of the baby jar whenever the, the, the process that we see played out in Scripture over and over is that we, we don't live off of this milk, but we live on the solid food of the Word? Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. He says, but brothers, I, but our brothers cannot address you as spiritual people. Again, he's talking to the church. He's talking to people who have professed faith in Christ. And he says, I couldn't address you as Christians, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. And even now, you're not ready. For you are still of the flesh, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way. So what Paul is unpacking for us is this, there's this expectation that whenever you get saved, you don't stay the same. But what happens at the moment of justification, sanctification kicks in, the, the, the truth that we are becoming more Christ-like. But what we've, what we've done is we, we've, we've wanted to, to live in the spiritual labor and delivery room and not take a step forward, not grow in our faith. This over here, this baby food is, is all I need. I'm satisfied. It's comfortable. I don't have to really work at it. I don't have to really sacrifice for it. So just give me the crushed peas and let me be on my way. And Paul would say, that's not right. That's not what we're called to. We're called to have an appetite that grows and matures as we grow and mature. Because as we consume the word of God, what we, what we realize is that the bread that God gives us, the sustenance that God gives us, it's good. And we want more of it. Just like, guys, like, it's just like our appetite. As we eat good things, we want good things. And so our appetite should progressively be maturing. Jesus says that we're blessed when we have an appetite for righteousness, when we hunger and thirst for righteousness. I think we, we tend to adopt a partial view of righteousness, and, and this often derails our spiritual growth. You know, maybe we're at a point where we, we, we want an appetite for the deeper things of God. We want an appetite for righteousness. But I, I think sometimes we just have a partial view of, of righteousness and, and we stumble. You know, whenever scripture talks about righteousness, there are generally three types of righteousness that, the, that scripture is referring to. Uh, one is legal righteousness. The second is practical righteousness, and then the third is social righteousness. Legal righteousness is that which is imputed to us by God. You know, Paul references this in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, whenever he says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
So the moment that you place your faith and trust in Christ, positionally, you go from a child of wrath to a child of God. So positionally, that righteousness is imputed to us. We're adopted as sons of God because Christ's perfection is credited to our account. So that's legal righteousness, positional righteousness. I think the righteousness that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 5, 6 is is practical righteousness. Because remember who he's talking to. The context of Jesus' sermon is to people who've already chosen to follow him. So he wouldn't be talking about this positional righteousness. He wouldn't be talking about imputed righteousness. He'd be talking about right-ordered living. What does it mean if I say that I'm a follower of God? What does my life look like? What does it mean for my actions to be informed by my identity as a child of God? That's what Jesus is talking about here. If at the moment of justification we are sons and daughters of God, then what does sanctification look like? And if we're being honest, I think this is where we tend to, if we're going to fail in discipleship, this is where it's going to happen. Because this is actually where the cost of discipleship is realized. You know, we, we like the idea of imputed righteousness that God did, all of the heavy lifting to make us a son or daughter of God. We, we believe, Romans 10, 9, that if we uh, confess, that if we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, and, yeah, there's that whole Lord thing in there. But if we do that, then, then we're right with God. Well, yeah, but there's a cost to it. Because we can't take on the identity of a child of God and then continue living as if we're not. And what's difficult about this is that what God demands of us is everything. What God requires of us is that everything else is secondary. Even the most, even the most important things in your life are secondary to the call of us to live as children of God. And so we see that practical righteousness is a right-ordered way of living that's dependent on our relationship with God. And then it's meant to impact every single part of our life. What we're not called to is a life where basically it doesn't change, but we just sprinkle Jesus on it a little bit. Jesus is on the fringes enough to, you know, he's there, but he's not really a priority. And there's some lies that I think we've bought into that really, really hinder our growth in Christ. You know, whenever the writer of Hebrews says to to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, they're not just talking about what happens here at the church. But what that's speaking to is the community that you run with. Who is it that's speaking into your life? Do you you gather together with friends and family who, who encourage you to, to consume Christ, to encourage you to hunger for Christ. This is important. This is what we do is here is important, but what, but what the writer of, of Hebrews is really encouraging us to do is to make sure that everything that we do is rooted in our faith in Christ if we call ourselves a Christian. And there are some things that I think cause us to lose sight of the importance of this call in our life. And we see it happen over and over in the church. Statements like, well, I can have church in a deer stand. I can have church on a boat. You know, we, we'll get together and we have a little devotional before we play a game. Friends, if, if our relationship with God is dumbed down to simply throwing him in as an add-on to everything that we do, 
then we need to get our priorities straight. Because what, what Jesus died for was not to be a, a seasoning that we put on the food. What Jesus died for was not so that we could have a side dish of Jesus with the main dish of our life. But what Jesus died for was so that we would hunger after him because ultimately he knows that he is the only one that can satisfy. Nothing else and no one else can satisfy. And so we're not called to a righteousness. We're not called to an order of living where Jesus is somewhere in our top 10 list of priorities. But we're called to a relationship where Jesus is the paper on which our priorities are written. It's right-ordered living. We see it played out in the Beatitudes. The first four Beatitudes are Beatitudes that are focusing on how we relate to our Heavenly Father. Addressing our spiritual poverty, addressing our grief, meekly submitting to God and hungering for His righteousness. We, we see this also played out in the Ten Commandments. If you read the Ten Commandments, the first five deal with our relationship with God. The second five deal with our relationship with people. So the priority for us as children of God, if our identity is in Christ, our priority is to figure out how to make God the priority in our life and then everything else will be figured out. Everything else will be worked out. If we understand Exodus 20 verse 2, which is the foundation for the Ten Commandments, where, Jesus, where God says, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. We have to understand that in order to understand our right order of living. And so it goes back to the question, what are we hungry for? The things that we're hungry for are the things that we worship. Are we worshiping our Heavenly Father? Are we worshiping the only one that is truly the Lord of our life? And so we have positional righteousness. We have practical righteousness, which the, the, the difference in these two, uh, these two terms help us understand Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, which this is a statement that Jesus said that, that has caused a lot of folks to, to stumble over. He says in verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes, and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So to understand that really quickly, what Jesus is addressing there is the outward show of righteousness that the Pharisees had. Because if you read the verses right after that, Jesus begins going in on the heart issue. Where he says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit murder. But I say to you, if you have anger for your brother in your heart, you've committed murder. He says, I, I, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say, if you look on uh, somebody in lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Jesus was pushing back against the self-righteous uh, attitude of the Pharisees where all they were concerned about was getting practical righteousness right without addressing the heart of the matter. That's why Jesus would go on to say in Matthew chapter 23, you Pharisees, you're like whitewashed tombs. On the outside you look clean, but inside you, you guys are filthy. So we have positional righteousness, we have practical righteousness, and then that leads to social righteousness. We could call it social justice, we could call it social rightness. The problem is that often we, the world, and sometimes Christians, we burn red hot our passions burn red hot for an aspect of social justice and social righteousness without really doing the job of making sure that our practical righteousness is what it needs to be. Without really making sure that our life is rightly ordered through the word of God toward Christ. And so we lean into things like social, moral, and political decay without really knowing what Scripture says about it. Without really answering the question, what, what would Jesus do about these things? You know, if, if the best argument that we can give for our worldview is anything other than the Word of God, that means we probably need to turn off the television. We probably need to get off social media. We probably need to stop being discipled by things that aren't godly. And we probably need to hunger for the word. 
So the truth behind this beatitude is we understand righteousness. If we're, if we're to hunger for a rightly ordered life, the truth is that no political mandate, no charismatic leader, no wisdom of man will ever truly satisfy. So stop looking for it there. Stop looking for Washington, D.C. to solve our problems. Stop looking for a savior. Why are we looking for a savior whenever we've had one for 2,000 years? Stop looking for a savior that doesn't care about us, but, but turn to the savior that cared enough for us that he lived and he died and he shed his blood so that he could make right everything that was wrong. Look for that savior. And so the truth is there is only one that can fill us. And so if we hunger for righteousness, we are hungering for God. We are hungering for right-ordered living, so as we hunger for righteousness, we get more Jesus. We get more of his presence, which is ultimately what we need. I think it's profound that if you read the, the story of Job, if you read the account of Job, you read that he asked over and over why these things happened to him. And, and you know the answer that God never gave him? God never told him why. In fact, the, the conversation typically went something like this. God, why did these things happen? And God's response, hey, have you considered the ostrich? What? Have you considered the behemoth and Leviathan? Have you considered my creation? Have you considered who I am, what I've done? God didn't give Job a why. God gave Job more God. And ultimately, that's what we need because the reality is, and to be clear, that, that when we hunger for righteousness, we don't get it simply because we're hungry for it. But we get it because God gives it to us. God enables us to have a rightly ordered life through his presence and through the kingdom. So that Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, is true for the life of the believer. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. This is the ending statement that Jesus had whenever he was leaning into the anxiety of this world. He said, be anxious for nothing. Don't be anxious for what you what you'll wear, what you'll eat. I Man, look at the birds. How much more important, how much more valuable are you all to me than birds? Look at the lilies. Man, they don't, they don't put together clothes. But man, whenever they're in bloom, they're arrayed finer than Solomon's best garments. How much more valuable are you than the lilies of the field? And Jesus' take-home message in this thought is, what your job is and what my job is, is not to seek first money to pay the bills, not to seek first things to satisfy us, not to seek first comfort in this world, but seek first the kingdom of God, and then all of these things will be added to you. All these things will be worked out because the truth is Jesus is faithful. God is faithful. He doesn't leave us to languish wanting, but God gives us what we need just when we need it. The things that we think satisfy us in life, Jesus says, man, if you seek the kingdom, Seek my righteousness. Seek this right ordered way of life. Be hungry for that. Then I'm going to take care of you. I'm not going to leave you wanting. And then we see a picture in Revelation chapter 7, verses 16 and 17. John writes this. He says, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So we who are in Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to hunger and to thirst for a right way of living. It's only through the Holy Spirit. Somebody who doesn't have Christ in their life, who doesn't have the Holy Spirit in their life, they, they don't hunger for right living as it relates to God. So that's why we should not be shocked whenever a sinner acts like a sinner. But if we who have Christ, or maybe rather if we who Christ has us, 
if we are living rightly, what that means is we are empowered through the work of the Holy Spirit to desire godly things and to see God's kingdom built on this earth because our identity is in him. And the promise is that both in this life and the one to come, we will be satisfied. In this life, we're satisfied one day at a time until we get to heaven. We're ultimately, I, mean, I love the line of that song, of praise his name. That one of these days, we're going to see Jesus face to face. The one who died for our sins, the one who shed his blood. We're going to know what his face looks like. We're going to worship him forever. We're going to live with him forever in perfection, reconciled with him. And so John would say in Revelation that because the lamb is there, we no longer have to hunger and thirst for righteousness because everything that was broken is made right because we will be with him forever. So as Josh and the team comes forward to lead us in a response song, I I just want to encourage you to, to respond to the word today. The good news is that if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if, you, if you're at a point in your life where you realize that you can't hunger after righteousness because God is not, uh, the Spirit of God is not in you, that, that, that Christ is not your Savior, I urge you, respond to the invitation of the gospel. Don't wait until you have life figured out. Don't wait until things get better. Don't wait until... You just deal with that little habit that you're ashamed of. But the call of our Heavenly Father is to come as you are, weary and broken, and He'll give you rest. Maybe your story is that you have at one point placed your faith and trust in Jesus, but this this idea of a growing appetite for God's righteousness. A growing appetite for God himself is something that, man, that's just not present. But you've been consuming things of this world that doesn't really satisfy. Can I tell you that in just a moment, we're, we're going to stand and we're going to worship. There's going to be folks up here at the front that want to pray with you. The altar's open. This is a call to repentance. Stop as, as Jeremiah says, stop digging wells that can't hold water. But find satisfaction, find rest in the one who is able, in Christ. So I'm going to pray and we're going to respond. And we love to pray with you. We love to minister to you and show you how as we hunger for Christ, as we hunger for this right ordered living, we find satisfaction. Father, we just, we thank you for that precious truth that as we hunger, as we simply hunger for you, that we find fulfillment, that we find satisfaction. And so, Lord, I pray that this morning as as we respond to your word, Father, I pray that you would convict hearts. Father, I pray that you'd tear down walls. Father, I pray that the chains of sin that might be capturing hearts today, Father, I pray that you'd break those chains. Father, I pray that you'd make us uncomfortable. Lord, help us to not be okay walking out of this building carrying the same old burdens that we've always carried and wonder why we feel so beaten down whenever you invite us to cast all of our cares upon you because you care for us. The God of ages cares for us. So Lord, convict us, break us. And Father, give us the wisdom and the urgency to respond. Father, we love you and we thank you for loving us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.